there is one thing that's happening in agriculture, and I think it's important for me to touch on because it's going to impact what I'm saying here, is that uh, many of you are tragically young. Uh, if I look out over the audience, it's not your fault. You'll grow out of it. Don't worry about it. But nonetheless, uh, I think many of us uh, of considerable, considerably more years have not really bothered to, to tell you uh, all the advantages uh, of getting older. You know, most of you are not looking forward to it, and that's a shame, too, because I'm, I'm 67, and you'll be tickled to death to be 67. I want to let you know that it's, it'll be a high point in your life. It's really exciting. There are some things that you can do a lot better. Jan and I, for instance, can sleep faster than we used to. <laughs> you know, it used to take us from 10.30 to about 6 o'clock to get that job done. We can do it by 4 o'clock now. <laughs> yeah, nod your head. You're there already, are you, guy? Yeah, okay, 4 o'clock, you're awake. And especially if there's anything at all, any problems, hangnails, debt, you know, all that kind of stuff, you're awake. And you can tell from the breathing on the other side of the bed, she's awake too. And yet you'll say, are you awake? There's nobody in the house but two people, and you're still whispering. I have no idea what that's about. And that's when you sit and catalog all your worries and woes and, and hope for the sun to come up. But I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening. But... Many of you, have any of you ever watched UF Farm Report ever, have ever seen the show? Well, great. If, if you know anything, we finally got a really good host when time came in and replaced me last year, but I still get to play at home, so to speak. And I've got my own uh, mini studio and robot cameras, and I film my own stuff of varying quality. I get a lot of flack from the videographers up there. But nonetheless, uh, I'm able to contribute and uh, still add to it. But it's in my wood shop. When corn hit $7, my reward to me was to build a very modest 75 by 40 woodworking shop. Okay? And I am in the background of some of my shots. Uh, we can go ahead and turn the lights off. It'll, I think, help the screen or uh, wherever. And I'm much better looking in dim light, so that'll, that'll work too. No, I'm gorgeous in, when it's pitch black. I just, uh, but what we uh, guys have been, I've been noticing, I get emails in from people and they say, have you got the new DeWalt 13 inch planer? How do you like that? And they're not paying any attention to anything that I'm telling them, all the wisdom that I, in my commentaries, these guys are checking out my tools behind them. Now I'm a woodworker and uh, it's a passion of mine and woodworking, uh, the number one commandment is that True craftsmanship is only one power tool away. <laughs> and for the most part, farmers buy into this too. There's nothing that gets us a little more excited than if we have to, or want to, and can justify, is a better way of doing it, getting a new tool. And that's why you love, we love to go to the farm shows and we're talking and we're out around uh, walking through the machinery tools are just a really a big part of how we derive satisfaction from life. I had a guy write in to me, and he asked for several shows when I first shifted to filming it back in the very end of my woodshop. He said, crying out loud, Pips, how many tools do you have? And I rolled back to him, I said, well, to the best of my knowledge, all of them. <laughs> and that's pretty much my goal on the whole thing. So I'm here today to tell you. Uh, it's, it's been interesting. I've been in this business long enough now that there's been kind of a cycle. It used to be 15 years ago, a uh, meeting planner would call me up for, you know, uh, somebody having their annual meeting or a conference or something like that. They said, well, here's the deal, Phipps. You know, we know you're a humorist and or you write humor and we'd like to have you get, here's what we're going to have. We're going to have the marketing guy come in and they're going to have the finance guy come in and then we want you to get them back in a good mood before they go home. <laughs> and that was my job. Then, five or six years ago, the message started getting changed. And the meeting planner would call up and say, all right, here's the deal, Phipps. We're going to bring you in, and we're going to have the marketing guy come in, and then we're going to have the finance guy come in, and then, for God's sakes, call them down before they go home. <laughs> well, we're back. We've come full circle. And in this year, I'm starting to get the same request I had 15 years ago. And that's for a good reason. I am not here to try to tell you when to market your grain or cattle. I'm not here to try to provide detailed information that really I'm not an expert on. But what I can, I think, do as an engineer, as a woodworker, as a farmer, is to tell you that I've got really good news because what we've got coming toward us means we have 
all the justification we need to acquire some new tools. And so we're pretty excited about that. I'm, uh, I'm going to pitch one. Yeah, we're getting there. But see, this is uh, what I show in my shop. And so for those of you who are tool lovers, we're there. Now, why is it we're going to need new tools? Well, what we've gotten into is that, and by the way, this information, I made up part of it, but most of it's real. Uh, you, you have a hard time separating which is which. But at the end of this presentation, please feel free to get a copy. You can download it. I'm sure Kurt could print it out for you somewhere. But the last two pages are all references where my stuff comes from, I, you know, in case you doubt with this. But I'm going to give you some information about what's going on and how we can get some new tools. And if you want more on it, and I would strongly suggest that, please take a look at the, uh, the whole presentation. You can get a print out of it. What happens is our mind is now heading, it, and it doesn't really matter anymore, almost all the sectors of agriculture, uh, cow-calf guys still hanging in there, but hogs, not good, dairy, really not good, looking ahead, uh, wheat, ho oh, ho ho and corn, <laughs> soybeans, ditto, it's really hard to find anybody who's going, yes, this looks like a great year coming up. And so consequently, there's something that happens to your brain. Your brain reaches a decision, and this happens in your, not in so much in your conscious mind, in your prefrontal cortex, but deep in your emotional part, your animal brain, and it says there's not enough. There's a really good book called Scarcity, Why Having Too Little Means So Much, where they study what happens when people who are really poor, or think, and I mean, this is relative, it doesn't matter whether you're a millionaire, if you're looking at suddenly your income is dropping down into the $500,000 range, uh, you, you, know, you feel the, this is a scarcity. There's, you know, I, there's not enough. And so it, it's not an absolute figure. But they study the, uh, the, uh, the effects of poverty on the brain and how we make decision, decisions. And when scarcity strikes, and I think that's exactly what I'm seeing in audiences and hearing from farmers when I talk to them, uh, this is hardwired or at least pre-wired into our brains, there are certain things that our brain does in order to alleviate that. It's like being very, very hungry. People who are starving literally cannot think of anything except food. It's no matter how hard they try, that's all they can then This is how your brain keeps you alive. There will be, there is a possibility that you will obsess and spend way too much time and won't be able to make good decisions simply because your brain has gone into scarcity mode. You will start tunneling. In other words, you're not going to pay attention to anything except how to make bucks selling wheat. That's all that really matters. And so you're going to disregard all kinds of other things going on around the world. This is called tunneling. You're, it's almost like your vision just narrows down to that. You will be, once you reach a scarcity mode, and they measured this in uh, Indian sugar farmers, uh, in the, uh, the, the sugar growing sugar cane area. Uh, Indian sugar farmers, they have one harvest, and then right before the harvest, almost all of them are out of money, and these are you know, subsistence farmers, and they, uh, the, uh, the, in the study, there were uh, some thousand farmers, and they measured their IQ. You will lose up to 13 points of IQ, and that's a lot, people. You know, that's what? 15, 20% for most of us, okay? <laughs> you know, some of you, can, I'll wait while you do the math, but... <laughs> No, and so you're, here you are, you're going to be facing a really tough year, and your brain is going to be hobbling itself, lowering your IQ because it's simply going to be that focused. You're going to be facing this with less than your full complement of abilities. You will have less willpower. The important thing about willpower is if you stop and think about each day, when you first wake up, you probably have somewhere between three to five really good rational decisions in you. All right? That's it. That's it until you go to sleep again. No. And I, th there's good research on this, too. Don't waste it deciding which kind of cereal to have. All right? We'll talk a little bit more about this. But think about the fact that your decision-making building in your willpower, your, your ability to stick to a decision, uh, to avoid temptation, to whatever you want, will be lower. If you know these things, then we can start getting some tools. It matters about our move. Now, I'm an engineer. I'm a farmer. I did not get into either of these professions because I'm a people person. 
I am not a people person. I don't particularly like people, if you want to know the truth. I am a machine person. I am a computer person. I am even, if necessary, a large smelling animal person. And there's a good reason why I work by myself. Okay? And that's, a lot of us farm because we're the only people that can get along with us. <laughs> right? And the only other ones that possibly can are those who have already promised in front of a judge or a congregation that they will. And that they you know, kind of feel kind of honor back. Or, you know, they're by blood can. And that's the reason it happens. We farmers, on the whole, are really not uh, people people. And so talking about moods is not top of the list for us. However, if I had to express something, and, and if you want, don't want to believe this, you need to talk to a farm audience in Iowa right now. There's a good reason for that. Uh, the media has found, as I discovered, that the one persistent way to get their message to stick more than five seconds in your brain is to scare the bejesus out of it. <laughs> and this has carried over, of course, to the campaign. And if you take a look at them, the campaign commercials are overwhelmingly negative. It doesn't matter where you are. Nobody really wants to hear, things are going to get better, and here's how I'm going to make it. No, they want to tell you about all the horrors. And if you watch what happens, and I've talked to farmers in Iowa, it wears them out. It's just difficult. Uh, you know, they watch the Rose Bowl. That was, not only did they get to see a really brutal game for Iowa, that was sad in itself, but then the commercial breaks were worse. And so it just was a terrible thing. Fear leads to anger. There's an awful lot of anger out there. I get angry emails, and it leads to a feeling of unfairness. How this affects you, first off, it's contagious. You spread fear. You're, you're like a kindergartner going to school, who are the worst germ carriers in the world. Grandchildren are little disease vectors <laughs> in your life. And you just, and at the first week of school, you just want to avoid them. They're bad, bad news. And those little runny nose rascals come up and give you a hug and you're doomed. That's all there is to it. It is contagious in your voice, in the look in your face. About 15 years ago, there was a brawl at an NBA game in Indianapolis. A guy named Ron Artest. I don't know whether anybody remembers that or follows basketball. He was a pretty good basketball player, but he's a great pugilist, turns out. Uh, started a brawl and a lot of people were hurt. Uh, well, yeah, a dozen or so. And, and it just spread into the stands. There were people who panicked. And when the paramedics got there, they have a record. The medical records show that they had hundreds, hundreds of people who were in full blown panic. Heart beats over 120, elevated blood pressure, eyes dilated, all the things that would happen if a lion had you know, pounced down beside them. That kind of panic. And the weird thing is, most of those people were sitting in places they could not have seen what the heck was going on. How did they get so scared? And it turns out they saw it in the faces that rippled around the stadium. The people who could see had fear on their face. We can recognize that in a millisecond. Our brains are designed to be able to read people's faces, and it's instinctive. It happens at birth. Babies can do it. And you see fear on somebody else's face, you hear it in a phone call from a son or a daughter or somebody, you've had that phone call from college, you knew when they said, hi, dad, or hi, mom, this is not a good news phone call, <laughs> right? Now, of course, they never were, but at least it was maybe just more money. But at any rate, this is how fear spreads. And this is what's happening. And it's contagious. You just need to be aware of it. It is long lasting. Happiness lasts about 20 minutes. Fear could go for weeks. It's, you know, there's no symmetry to it, it's not there. But the biggest thing is, you're not going to be able to be as innovative trying to solve answers. This is why I'm here. And I got here just in time, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get some new tools. Here's our first one. Now, if any of you who are woodworkers, a lot of times you'll spend almost a day, or you could spend up to a day or so, building a jig. And a jig is something, or if you're a welder, that holds everything in place so that you, when you finally do something, cut a board, weld something, tack it together, nail it together, glue it up, it's square, it's straight, and everything, and you, so you have to build these things. Well, let's build some jigs for our brains. Let's help our brains make better decisions by holding things still. Here's a good one. Embrace the idea of a rut. Now, you give old people a hard time, because I get up every morning, have the same thing for breakfast. We do the same thing every day, 
and we have a routine, a Monday routine and a Tuesday routine and everything, and you just think, oh, that's old geezers, and they're just they're stuck in their ways, and no, no, we're conserving brain power. You people are wasting it, you know. <laughs> I know what I have for breakfast. If it's Monday, it's yogurt, and Tuesday is bagel day, which is the high point in my life. That shows you what happens to your life on, you know, thrill the levels that you get those lower down. So it's something that takes less to make you excited as you get to be my age. And so bagel day, it's a big day. I, I'm up, up for that. Keep in mind that idea of three to five good decisions. All right? Don't waste them on what color socks. Don't waste them on who's right and wrong about the last argument you had with your best friend or a spouse. Hoard that decision making power. Now, it doesn't read uh, very well. I'm going to change that. I'm sorry about that. That's a great quote from Upton Sinclair. Recognize that you have conflicts of interest. There are times when you simply are not going to be able to answer a question because if you answered it correctly and using your full brain power, it would be an answer you really don't want. One of the things that I think is happening in my part of the country, we grow corn and soybeans, period. And there's nothing else that could faintly possibly be done. What happens when the price of corn and soybeans both are terrible? <coughs> well, we don't like to think about that, all right? This is the direct conflict of interest. What if we couldn't grow those things in Illinois? It's simply, it is truly and literally unthinkable. I've asked farmers that. Well, what would you do if we couldn't do that? Well, we just, we, uh, we just can't. Oh, it could happen. You know, $2 corn could do that. We can't grow corn for $2. But if you can recognize that there are some questions, there are some issues that are going to come before you that you simply, you're in a conflict of interest. You are so deeply embedded in either your political loyalty, your regional thinking, your powers of habit, your history, your traditions, things that you are really, really important, you're not going to be able to make a rational decision or an optimal decision. And just, I'm not saying they're wrong, but you need to keep in mind that a conflict of interest generally doesn't produce a good outcome. Always ask if there's one thing you can do to help you make good decisions coming up in the, in the air, if you can bring yourself to say, okay, what would it take to change my mind? If you come up with something, you know, I can't think of anything that would change my mind on this issue, then it's no longer a decision, it's an uh, article of faith, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that, if you have, but once you get about 20 or 30 of those, you don't have any decision-making room anymore. You don't have any latitude to make any changes. But if you can't come up and say, well, okay, and we talked about this this morning. I just got off the radio. We did a free-for-all session. If you're not listening to AgriTalk on Tuesdays and Fridays, it's really kind of a lot of fun. Me and Jim Wiesmeyer and, and uh, Chip Flory uh, just shoot the bull about all kinds of things. And we finally, today we came up with the idea that if Trump does win Iowa, a lot of us are going to have to change our mind about what could possibly happen. But we, Jim and I have been totally, totally wrong for six to eight months. You know, he's going to collapse, going to collapse, he's going to go away. Ain't happening. You know, we've been really wrong. What would change my mind? Trump wins Iowa. Think about those things in your life. All right, land prices dropped 25%. Okay. All my, I need to revise my entire world outlook and go from there. But try to come up and, and bring it, those are hard, hard questions. And it really helps if you've got a friend you can sit down with, somebody you really don't have to protect yourself with and your ego will talk about it. That's a great logic, Jim. Uh, here's some other decision widgets. Uh, widgets are the things, you go to a farm show and the big shiny pieces of hundred thousand or several hundred thousand dollar machinery are in the center, and it's the guys around the outside. How many of you like to go around outside those one little, one part stalls where some guys invent this deal that bolts on the side of your combine and helps you change the feeder house chain? And it's a little thing you weld on there, or you tie, tie on, it's a little bit. Well, these are, these are what engineers call widgets, and I love them. They're just little, great little things. Here, a couple things you can do. Uh, if you're like most people, you don't think you're like most people. Okay, I lost you there. I can see that already. Dead silence, crickets chirping. This is the most persistent human trait is the belief that we're unique. All of you believe you're not like anybody else. 
Trust me, people, you are. Believe in the average. If I had my way, I'd be selling little bands that have WWMG LMD. What would most guy, guys like me do? Because if you ask people a question, what do you think you what will you do if corn prices go to three dollars? What will you do if wheat prices go to three dollars or two fifty or something like that? You'll get one answer. If you ask that same person, what will guys like you, you know, farmers like you, your category, what will they do when corn prices are three dollars? You will get an answer that is incredibly highly correlated to what that person is actually going to do. The minute put, you put you in the question, it changes our answers. And so always sit, try and frame questions in terms of what will people like you do? And you'll find it remarkably predictive of yourself. You're terrible, we're terrible predicting our own actions in the future. But if we think of ourselves as simply, let's talk about guys like me, it's remarkably, it's called surrogacy, and it's remarkably effective. Uh, do not brag about how hard and furiously you work. Uh, there's something that's important to remember that we now know why humans sleep. And then you think, well, we get tired. No, it's a lot of mammals. For instance, your heart never stops. You don't have to, well, and why is it we just bother to sleep at all? It turns out our brain literally takes out the garbage while we sleep. You clear the synapses in your brain so that you have more thinking power in the morning. That's the reason why uh, it's really important to treat sleep with a lot more respect than it currently gets. People, farmers who come up and say, well, yeah, we've been working 18 hour days. It's to me that I hear that as saying, I take stupid pills. <laughs> really bad decisions get made late at night after a long day, especially in the dark. No, really, when did you, are you married, sir? Yeah, when did you propose? Was it in the dark? Aha! Aha! Okay, just think about that, all right? Oh, how many of you have ever been on a school board or a farm bureau board, a co-op board, something like that? What happens when the meeting goes to about 10.30? Trustees at the church, there's my favorite. Does the quality of decision making suddenly get better because it's really late? No. The other reason is that we are diurnal creatures. The animal part of us, we have very poor eyesight. Our hearing is not particularly good compared to other mammals. We function best when the sun is out. Here's the deal. If you've got an important decision or a forecast, you've got to say, OK, I have to prepare for the future, and here's going to be my, my best guess at the future. Here's how to do it. Get up in the morning, slightly before sunrise. Wait till the sun is up. Do not turn on any device. Do not uh, turn on your phone. Don't look at the internet. And if you want, read a few passages of something uh, meaningful or inspirational. It can be scripture, it can be a good autobiography, it's what I use. It can be any number of things. For about 15 minutes, have one cup of coffee. One cup of coffee will raise your IQ about four points. <laughs> hey, we need all the help we get. We just lost 13, remember? Okay. You're still down. All right. And then make your decision if the sun is up. You will find the quality of your decision making will increase dramatically. The minute you see the first piece of news, the minute you see the first number, regardless of whether it has anything to do with your decision or not, you have skewed your decision to sell 10,000 bushels of wheat or to hold the cattle or, or to buy the land. Do that with a fresh brain and do it when the sun is out. Okay? All right. The other thing is, as I mentioned, many of you are too young to remember this, but you're about to hear an awful about, about the 1980s. Now, this is not, uh, there are several reasons for this, but the biggest one has to do with the fact that many of us who went through the 80s had to listen to our fathers drone on and on about what? The Great Depression. I heard more Great Depression stories going on. My dad died, uh, faintly disappointed that the second Great Depression hadn't come. Because by God, he was going to be ready for it this time. Yeah, he'd learned his lesson, this time he's going to be ready. And it was just, it, we were, he was, he was just kind of sad that we hadn't had a, you know, a soul-crushing depression uh, in his time. Those of us who went through the 80s, 
we had to listen to those stories, so it's your turn. And so we're going to start telling you all about the 80s, whether you want to hear about it or not, or whether it's applicable. Actually, I'm with Mark Twain on this. I think the 80s maybe will kind of rhyme with what we see, what I see coming for us. It's not exactly analogous. But the other thing is, the 80s weren't just about timeless fashion and unforgettable music. Now, goodness knows, uh, we all remember it uh, as a high point in cultural history. But nonetheless, uh, what did we learn in the 80s? These are the just, uh, I try not to drone on and on to my son about this, uh, about the 80s. Oh, it was tough in the 80s, and you know, I, I realize it was the last time, 1987 was a tremendous uh, bottom in, in the agriculture. But what we learned was a couple of three things that aren't, we don't really talk about. Uh, first off, that safety nets really can save. But the safety net I am talking about is not crop insurance or a government program or uh, anything that we normally call a safety net. The safety net that made a difference in my life and that I've talked with other farmers about that were the people around us, our friends, our families, the relationships we had. And for people who are not people, people, which is all, you know, pretty much everybody in this room, this was a stunning recognition when we finally realized that was what made the difference is that I could sit down with a bunch of guys just like me. We were all struggling with this. And it, it's not that they provided answers. It's just that they reassured me that I wasn't the only guy going through this. And you have no idea how important that is to know that other people are doing this. And the fact that other people are surviving leads you to the same conclusion, cripes, if Dan can do it, I can do it. I became a poster child. People, it was a common thing. Well, you know, if Pips is doing it, you, anybody can do it. <laughs> no, that's, that's what you end up doing. It is self-reinforcing. There is also what's called the friend effect. Uh, uh, Jonathan Haidt, uh, brilliant behavioral e economist and psychologist at uh, uh, University of Virginia, well, he's now at Harvard, did an incredible study. He brought a bunch of, and when he was at UVA, uh, he brought a bunch of students out. Uh, they're right near the foothills, the Appalachians, and they had a park there, and he said, for 10 bucks, if you want to earn 10, 10 bucks or something, come out to the park and uh, wear hiking shoes. And so a, bunch of, a couple hundred people, uh, kids showed up, and they were at the bottom of a very steep hill, uh, and trails going up the hill. And he gave a questionnaire, and there were all kinds of questions about how do you feel today, what would you guess the temperature is, you know, all they just little, and buried in there was the one question that the actual study was about. Look at the hill ahead of you and rate it, one to 100, how difficult it would be for you to climb. So they got several base control groups, uh, uh, like that on Saturdays, and then the next, uh, then they started the second phase of the experiment. They said, "Come out to the park uh, on Saturday morning. We'll give you ten bucks. Bring a friend." That's all they said. Three words: bring a friend. Did not say how that was going to have to work or anything. So people showed up in pairs, and all the friend did was just stand there. That's all he did. Everything else was just the same. But when they rated how hard it would be to climb the hill, the presence of a friend standing beside them somehow changed their rating 27% lower. The, the friend effect is part of your safety net. The most important thing you can do in 2016 is to make sure you work very, very hard to keep your safety net intact. Work hard at being a good friend, a good spouse, a good family member, a good church member. Regardless of what's going on in your economic or financial life, make sure you maintain that. I'm curious about that too, is they started repeating this experiment because they couldn't believe the answers they were getting. When they had put backpacks on guys, suddenly they had 50 pounds on them. They said, now rate the hill. And it, of course they rated it a lot higher, or a lot harder to climb. But the effect of the friend was about 40%. In other words, when you feel like the challenge is even greater, the friend effect magnifies. Then they started asking, how long have you known this friend? Older friends, longer friendships, had a much more pronounced effect. Again, the effect was in the 40% range. Always remember, and this is somebody 67 years old, you can't make old friends. You can make new ones. You can't make old friends. 
before you sever any long-standing relationship, for whatever reason, whether it's deserved or not, you can never, ever make another old friend. Never throw an old friend away quickly. It should be a very painful and difficult thing to end that relationship. 